Hey there, Tim from Alpha Wolf Trading wanting to thank you for stopping by to watch this interview and also make it clear to you that this is not a paid for promotion. I collect no compensation for the interviews I do here. These companies have been identified as opportunities for investment that could provide a, an above average return on our investment. This is our opportunity to get to know management, to understand the vision for the company, the strategy they plan to implement uh, and execute to achieve that vision for the company. So if you learn anything here today and you enjoy the interview, please do us a favor and subscribe to the Alpha Wolf Trading YouTube channel. Hey everybody, Tim from Alpha Wolf Trading coming at you with another CEO interview and I want to thank Cameron Watt for coming and take the time to tell his story as well as the story for IN, INXSF, which is trade on the OTCQX, right? Cameron, um, thank you for taking the time to come in. I originally was, I think uh, Maj from Geo is actually the one that got me interested in your story. And then I got to meet you at SNN not long ago. And we had a great conversation there and finally get an opportunity to, to follow up with you and see what's happening over there at In Touch. What is it? In Touch? In Touch Insight. In Touch Insight. All right. So. Before we get into what the company does, I'd like you to kind of give me a little background on Cameron and how Cameron got to where he's at today and why he chose to be where he's at today. Assuming it's a choice, right? Uh, you know, uh, well, when, well, my, my father met my mother at a dance. I, oh, no, that's probably too far back, right? All right, we'll fast forward. So... I, I got uh, I got a couple of degrees. Uh, I'm, I'm from from Canada. I got a couple of degrees in business. Uh, you know, I got a VCOM from the U of A. I got an MBA from Ivy uh, here in Canada. And then after that, I did what what everybody does. You know, I I went and joined work for Pizza Hut. Um, yeah, and no, not kidding. Uh, I took a lot of hassle from everybody in my school year at that time. It's, it'd be kind of like coming out of Harvard and going to work for Taco Bell, right? Um, and so I, I, but I, 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 I like the industry, uh, I, and I, I joined at a relatively decent level. I was an area manager. I looked after a group of stores, and uh, and I worked my way up within within Pizza Hut until I was actually running national operations services for all of Canada, looking after a lot of things that went into 700 locations. And during my career, I worked at a franchise consultant. I worked at you know I worked at different levels in operations, and uh, got good exposure there. And then I went and uh, worked as a zone sales leader for Frito Lay. Um, ran a ran a, ran a about a forty million dollar chip business, and so I, I had some pretty some kind of big company stuff, right? But not in not in not in the finance and marketing. And I wasn't working for P and G and the the firms everybody else went to work for. But I, I was in the operations side, and I liked it. Uh, I wound up working. I uh, ran some divisions as well for Unilever, um, as well as Mars. Um, so I had a, kind of worked for a lot of really big companies. Had some pretty good jobs, and then uh, you know what? I had had enough. <laughs> of really big companies, um, you know, living in the, uh, had to be in the big city, had to be in the big office. Uh, the corporate politics was enough to just, you know, I just, like, I'm a prairie boy. For if you want to go back in my background, I'm, you know, I grew up in Alberta and, and we call a spade a shovel. And, you know, working in these big companies was uh, just cancerous to my soul, for the lack of a better way to put it. And not everybody. There were some really good people in those companies. There's also some just terrible, terrible cultural things that I didn't that didn't fit with me. Um, and so I wound up just checking out, uh, moved my family to a smaller city without a job, and started looking for work. Uh, the first thing I was going to kind of buy into didn't work out, and then I wound up getting a job uh, at InTouch Insight, where I started actually running the sales group. Uh, and I'd say sales and marketing, but we didn't have any marketing back then. It was very small. So we was only about 35 people in the company and none of them were in marketing. So I, I joined initially with the sales and kind of to try to help grow the company. Uh, and then two years later, uh, I was appointed to the job of CEO, uh, which was in the fall of 2013 for kind of, kind of 2014 being my first year. Um, and that was interesting. You know, uh, people always ask me, you know, what you what good and the bad and what have you. And, 
uh, I can tell you that at the end of my first year uh, with the title of you know president and CEO, um, I was left asking myself how I could be failing so remarkably in my job. You know, like it, it, it seemed like nothing I was trying to do was happening. You know, nothing was working. And I, and I was, just, I was literally, you know, just going, what, what is going on? I mean, I've never, I've, I've run, I, I have been incredibly successful running very large pieces of business. Why is this, you know, not working? And it turned out, you know, as I dug into it and as I started getting into it, uh, we had a uh, cancer in the culture at the company. And, you know, and, it, and what I learned was that even though I might be in a room of people and telling them what we wanted to do, when I left, their boss would say, we're not going to do that. Um, you know, oh, what about Cameron? I, I'll, I'll look after Cameron, you know. And, and they just weren't doing what I asked. So of course, nothing I wanted to get done was working. They weren't doing it. Um, and so it, once I figured out we had just a cancer in, in the organization and we had silos built where people were scared to go across, you know, um, they were scared to, to talk. They were scared to put their hand up because and the reason I didn't know, by the way, is because everybody was scared they'd get fired. Right? Everyone was scared if they told me anything, their boss would fire them. And so once I unsurfaced this, right, we very quickly cleaned house from a management standpoint. Um, I started putting a new team in place. We, uh, I actually brought in somebody whose strengths were in HR to run operations. Um, it was only temporary. I only did it for a couple, you know, for a year and a half, two before we moved, uh, moved them out, put some in operations. But we actually, I focused on fixing the culture of the business from, from the base top, right? And that's something to this day we're very proud of. Is when, 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 did, when did that initiative start? What, what year? Fall of 20, a well, year after I started, the fall of 2014, when, okay. I, when I was doing budgets for the next year and looking at my results for the first year and realizing this ain't work. And so, so that's when I figured it out. And really December was when the new person came in. I terminated the other, from earlier, a few people, and then we started rebuilding the team December 2014. And, you know, and honestly, I will stand here and say that if, if we hadn't started at the cultural level when we rebuilt the company, um, we would not have gotten through, for example, the pandemic like we did. You know, uh, it, it's the strength of the connectivity with the employees and strength of the team, frankly, their entrepreneurial spirit, their engagement with the customers, their attitude. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not the reason that we're successful, you know, uh, in terms of day to day getting things done and making sure the money comes in the bank and the People are happy. That, that's not me. You know, there's a lot of people that have to work really hard every day to make sure that happens. And, and in that culture that we build um, and having the right people in so that, you know, that can, in fact, take place um, is 100 percent, you know, why we have the people we have and, and why they want to stay and work for us and why we've had our success. And, and yeah, it does come from me in terms of creation in that, again, as I said, I call it spade and shovel. I have no time or, or patience for corporate politics, you know. I don't care if somebody's saying something the right way. Um, I, you know, we, we used to call, you know, we used to laugh in some jobs I have become where what mattered was, you know, it didn't matter what was on your slide when you presented to the big guys. What mattered was how many words you could do it in and what the font was and what the colors were. And, you know, if, if you got the formatting correct, right, you were 80% to having a good presentation. Um, that's not what we do here. You know, I don't, I don't care if you have, write it on a cocktail napkin and walk into my office. What I want to know is, you know, what's the content, right? It's not about form. It's not about positioning yourself for the next job. It's not about, you know, you know how people feel about this or that. It, it's about content. It's about actual results and productivity and what you deliver and what you can deliver. You know, and, and that, uh, you know, is, is I think, you know, I, I used to tell people when I lived in Alberta, I would go to, uh, I'd go to a bar after work um, and I would change out of my work clothes and put on jeans to go to the bar, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you live in cities like uh, like a Toronto, okay, I'm sure New York, uh, if you work in jeans, you will go home and change into a suit to go to the bar. <laughs> right? and, and it's because you want to be perceived a certain way. If you're trying to meet, you know, someone you're interested in, you got to look a certain way and and that's just not where I come from. It's not what I'm about. And we and so we've literally built this company. So what I'm about is just fundamental work and, and just, you know, uh, just basically morality and integrity. 
product. And, and that is what we built the foundation as company on entrepreneurial integrity driven culture. And it is honestly, uh, I think it's the reason that we're uh, continuing to be successful despite a lot of challenges. All right. So let's talk about what in touch insight focuses on. What, what is it that in, in a very simplistic manner, what do they do? We help other companies provide a better customer experience to their customers to ensure that they can maintain customer loyalty, increase revenues, profits, et cetera. Okay. And how do you do that? We have a number of tools available. We do in-person things, a services business, such as we do mystery shopping and auditing, where we will go out, we will check on, uh, you know, mystery shopping is where you go out and you, you, you basically send people to every location and you pretend you're a customer. Well, you actually know that you are a customer. They go be a customer, but they're looking for specific execution against standards. They will then uh, mark how that location did against all of those standards execution. Uh, we do the same thing with audits where they're typically unannounced, where we'll just show up and say, hey, we're here. But when an audit, there's the mystery shop. The mystery shop, somebody comes in, does it, leaves. No one in the location even knows they were there, right? An audit, you show up, you show a letter, and you say, hey, guess what? Here to check stuff. And the reason there's both is that it's pretty tough to go and start checking the temperature of people's food or you know, coolers and stuff if, you know, if they don't know why you're there. That looks a little suspect, right? Um, at the same time, it's, it's, all, it's impossible to tell if a cashier or an employee is being helpful and friendly if they know you're there to do an audit. Because I hope they're really helpful and friendly if they know right. you're there to measure their, their friendliness, right? So you, but you can only test things like that when, you're, when they don't know that you're actually measuring, right? So we have those two prongs that we use, and they work together on the services side. And then we also have software, which we've, and that's really the, the, what we've been bootstrapping, in fact, for years now is our software division. And we now have a customer survey product that uh, does exactly what a Qualtrics or a Medallia does. Um, we have all of those, you know, all the main core features they have, we have. In fact, we won an RP a little over a year, a year and a half ago now, against all of the big competitors in that space. We won a you know, six-figure RFP um, for, the, for that product. It's a very good product that we've built. We also have an operational uh, checklist product. So forms and automation checklist. So, you know, imagine anything you used to do in Excel or on paper or anything like that when you're running a business, you can now do on, on your phone or your tablet or wherever you want. And, it just, and you, can, you can enter it all through there. You can take pictures. You can annotate stuff. We have triggers, alerts, and notifications when there's issues. And, uh, you know, like that software, you can go in there and it can say, oh, this, you know, the coffee machine is broken. And you can code what's broken. And our system will automatically send an email, for example, to the repair company. Um, to notify them that there's a problem, as well as the district manager of a location or the manager, wherever you want. Right? So we have that operational software. So we've got you know operational software. We've got customer satisfaction survey software. We go and measure stuff out there. Uh, and so we so whether you're measuring yourself using our software, whether you're having us measure with 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 our own products and tools, and all of that funnels into one platform, one com like BI suite. But again, we built. We have our own BI suite. Um, it has, you know, some machine learning components in there. It does key driver analysis. It does sediment analysis. It does, you know, those analytics. And we have customers who not only bring our programs into there, but we can bring in third-party programs. So you can bring in the same store sales and measure how that's related to the other scores. You can bring in, um, we have customers who do, let's say, a program with somebody else uh, for part of their, for an age verification or something. They can bring that in and view it inside our platform. Right? And so that BI suite with all of its capabilities is part of all of our offerings, regardless of what you're buying. Uh, and then, of course, we can upsell pieces of software is what we're working towards right now to kind of get that software piece moving a little faster. So the software company that you say you're bootstrapping, now that is a, it is a recurring, is that a recurring revenue model type? Yes. Yeah, that's, that's an MRR model. That's a monthly recurring revenue stream and just, you know, like they, they sign up and pay monthly. Um, absolutely. So that's one of my favorite models. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting, Tim, is that our uh, the services business we have is is monthly recurring as well. It's not software, so it's not as sexy, but it is recurring revenue. We we have we were running at a ninety seven plus percent re, you know kind of revenue retention rate before the pandemic um, from our services. We have clients who have been with us for 10, 15 years, and they just and every month they just pay because we might go visit all your locations every month, right? And so, and it's just every month they pay. I want I want to highlight something because now you, that you just said that, I'm reflecting back to 
at SNN, I sat in on Maj and yours conversation and there was something that you said that you said that really resonated with me <clears throat> and it was something to the effect and maybe you can clarify for me but it was something to the effect that you have customers you had relationships with that got into a bind because of covid right and couldn't exactly pay their bill and you as a company stood by him. Yeah, we, you know what? Um, and again, this is this is that cultural integrity piece, right? Um, when, the, when the pandemic hit, as much as we were hurting, as much as we had problems, um, we had customers who had to physically close their doors. You know, they had a thousand locations and they weren't allowed to have a customer walk through that door, right? And yeah, I, and yeah, and I have contracts and my contracts say you have to pay me every month. My contracts say you still have to pay me for the services and the software and everything. That's what my contract said, right? We we did not even consider for a second pulling our contract. We let every single customer we had put their programs on hold immediately with no penalties, no fees, nothing, right? We just stopped it all. Even Anybody though that did. put a hurting on you guys. Of course. But I, I'm, you know, but but in the long run, you know, but in the long run, we didn't have any bad debts. Everyone paid ultimately. Took a while for some of us, but ultimately everyone paid us. Um, and by the way, uh, they came back and they're they're with us and they're doing and some of them are doing more with us, you know. Uh, and look, there's some people aren't even back yet. Like I'll give you an example: the automotive industry. Right? We've got some automotive customers who to this day have not brought their program back, even though my contract is ticking. Right? Um, I'm hoping 2023 is their year. Right? Uh, and we're getting some indication that it might be. Uh, there should be. Um, but if you think about auto sales for a second, anybody who's tried to buy a car in the last year and a half, two years knows that you can't walk in like you used to where there's three guys fighting for business and you're negotiating. No, it's a factory order. If you know, unless you take whatever they happen to have, which probably isn't exactly what you want. It's a factory order where you may or may not be able to get every feature that you want. And you're likely waiting nine months to a year. Well, why do they need me to go out and tell them that their customer experience is crappy right now for people buying a car? <laughs> I, I mean, they know, right? I mean, they know. But what's happening now is that the automotive people are starting to go, you know what? Yeah, okay. But this is starting to be a bit of a new normal. This is going to be a bit of a longer trend to get out of. We better start measuring to figure out what we could be doing better, right? We know it's not maybe the experience it was three years ago. And we know it's maybe not what it should be. But what is it, right? And where are the pain points for customers? And how do we compare to other people in the automotive industry and how do we get better so at least in this new world a new reality we can capture more can maintain our loyalty and capture more share right so that's why like i say i'm expecting them to be coming back but they have they haven't even come back yet because of that situation they've been in right uh, but most people over the last you know two years have come back in some way and they brought their programs back and i think that if we i think if we had taken the short-sighted view of trying to protect our own skins when the pandemic hit we we would not have the loyalty that we maintain through the pandemic I, I, I think people would probably have, you know, I, I think instead of giving us the credit for it, I think they would have held it against us. And, and it would have been the easy thing to do when we were worried about our own, you know, hind end. It would have been real easy to just, you know, say, yeah, we're going we, to, if you owe us money, you got to keep paying because um, I got to pay my people, right? Um, but we didn't. We, we did. So, and I, it, actually, that, that takes me to something else with the culture. One of the things we did to survive, besides, you know, because obviously once you do that, your, your revenue is not great. Um, you know, obviously we used every government program we could, but we also, every single employee in this company, um, from the board of directors to myself and down, every single person who was getting any remuneration from this company took a cut, right? Uh, the board waived their fees for six months. Um, I took a 50% pay cut for more than six months. I asked my uh, leadership team to take a 20% pay cut, and every employee took uh, between 5 and 15% depending on how much they were making. Every single person that's remainder of income took a pay cut for about seven months um, to make sure that we would have the cash that we would have. And, and you know what? They all did it. We didn't have anyone leave their job because we because we had to take a pay cut. Everyone got it. We, we, we were honest, we were open, we communicated with everybody. And then the board of directors turned around with the, and the shareholders turned around and voted for uh, restricted share units where we then, you know, a year later, turned around and gave people, you know, like, well, later we gave people uh, restricted share units in that fall. 
to kind of replace whatever they had put in. You know, the, what they'd given up, we gave them stock instead, but it vested over a year, right? So they, if you stuck with us to help us recover, then, you know, you'd get that back, but it would take you a year and it would be in shares. And, and so, so we did some things that were very, that, that, that were very fair. You know, the employees were incredibly fair with us and incredibly understanding, uh, very much entrepreneurial in terms of how we acted. And the company turned around, the shareholders turned around, were very fair back with them. And, and that's the type of relationship that gets you through hard times. And the same thing with our customers. I think that is, and that was the other, there, that was the other part I was hoping you were going to go to. But to me, you know, you want to build a loyal employee, right? <laughs> they all get stock options, not just, I mean, and I'm talking everybody, they got down to the person that cleans the bathrooms, right? Everybody should have the opportunity to participate in the success of the company. Yep. And I think that's powerful, right? And I think a lot of companies miss that, right? The, the executives at the top get the stock options and all that, but not everybody, right? And I think everybody should mm -hmm. because you're going to build loyalty. And when you have a team like that, they know that the harder they work, the, hopefully the odds are the company is going to be more successful. If the company's more successful, hopefully the stock participates, right? And then they get rewarded. And I think that that is powerful, right? Let me ask you a question. So you're trading on the, the OTC markets, right? Are there ambitions to uplist to a senior exchange at some point? Look, if I said there weren't ambitions, I'd be lying. Right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, of course, there's ambitions to uplift at some point. Um, the reason we haven't yet is honestly just, you know, we're, we're bootstrapping the software still. Um, you know, we, look, our, our, our MRR is up to over 100 grand a month, you know. Um, and frankly, if we were a California startup with a, over 100 grand a, a month in, in sticky software with the logos that we have it with, uh, we'd be trading it like, you know, many, many multiples of revenue for that part of the business, right? Um, and obviously, as we talked about, we're not, you know, because it's kind of confused by being uh, buried in that in that service. Um, and so while we're bootstrapping that, our baby, you know, and while we're getting that up and, and, and momentum running, uh, and while we're, you know, kind of using our cash and being keeping our powder a little bit dry, uh, we don't want to spend money. It is just, you know, to go to uh, the, the, the more senior exchange, we would qualify to do so in terms of where we're at right now. Um, but it's a very expensive exercise uh, relative to, to what we pay now, right? Um, you know, and, it's, and you don't want to, in my view, you don't want to just up. I, I understand being an OTC market is like OTC hell. I understand stock market hell. However, there are companies that want to get to the NASDAQ just to uplist to the NASDAQ because they think that's going to solve all their problems, yeah. right? Actually, it's going to create a whole bunch more problems if you move too early, right? You move too early, and then the next thing you know, you're spending the next year trying to stay listed on the NASDAQ, right? Which is not where you want to have your focus, right? You want to have your focus on growing the company. And I have told people in the past, why are you listening, up listening to the NASDAQ? If, you, if you're not firing on all cylinders and you don't have the wind in your sails and at your back, you're, you're going to create more headache for yourself, right? And it's costly. So I ask because I know the pains of being a thinly traded OTC stock. I get it. But you do it when it makes sense to do it when you're from a position of strength right how many shares do you guys have uh fully diluted outstanding do you know 25, 25 million 25 million which is <laughs> super tiny right 25 million and then you've been you're bootstrapping you're growing revenue right Mm -hmm. So how, how, are, how are we looking on, on revenue right now? How are you looking for cash right now? Well, I mean, revenue, you know, I, I have said it's going to be up 40 to 50% this year, right across the board. 
Um, you know, our, our numbers we just pushed out for Q2 were a 28% lift on the staff side of it, which hasn't really received our full attention yet either. Um, but, you know, so we're, we're expecting great growth this year. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're continuing to pay off you know, the money that we spent on our toys and different things, like, you know, by doing acquisitions, et cetera. So, you know, the, our cash flow is there. Uh, you know, and from a capital standpoint, we don't, we don't need, we're in a great position. Relative to micro caps today, uh, we don't have to go raise funds for our growth. Um, you know, I, I can grow from, you know, from 20X million this year to 30 million to 40 million. And I don't need to raise capital to do that. Um, you know, I don't need to dilute to do that. Um, and that's a pretty cool spot with the, because, you know, as it's not, it's just math, right? The lower the number of shares you have, uh, the, the, the higher the value per share for the total value of the company. It's not, it's not tricky. And so, and since I own about 10% of the company personally, you know, just under the Canadian tax laws, I can't own more. Every now, every now and then I have to sell the odd share just to, uh, just to make sure I never go over 10% because of our tax laws here. But, um, yeah, I own enough that I can say, I, 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 I want to work as much as possible. And, and you know, diluting constantly and raising money all the time is not typically a path to success unless you need the money to fund your growth to get to where you want to go. Uh, and we have that big old services business that can help fund where we need to go, um, which is a sticky customer based on recurring revenue. So let, let me get clarity on the services business, right? Is this primarily Canadian or is this in the U.S.? No, 78% of our revenue comes from the United States. From the United States? Okay, <laughs> so you're not you're not just stuck up there in Canada. I mean, you're actually. I, I, I don't I don't know if you've seen a map uh, or, or any economic stuff, but the U.S. is actually a lot larger than Canada for spending. <laughs> on stuff. Uh, yeah, I you know I haven't looked at a map lately, but I'm gonna now. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's like take any kind of banner you have, like even if, like for example, if you're doing business with even if you're doing business with Seven Eleven. I mean, there's like, there's X amount in Canada and 10X in the U.S., right? So, you know, for us, um, vast majority of our revenue, more than, like, like I say, more than three quarters of our revenue now comes from the U.S., and we expect that to only increase as we forward. Okay. And then your primary industries that you serve. So let's talk about that real quick here. So we've got, and I need my glasses, <clears throat> my better glasses. What do we got here? We've got... Um, Convenience stores, right? You've got, and I still can't see this. I got to go even further. It's grocery stores, it's pharmaceutical, it's retail, it's restaurants. Automotive, it's, right. Yeah, uh, it, alcohol, tobacco, and yeah. other retail. So the way, I, the way I explain it is you have to think about, you know, if somebody has one giant call center and that's all they have. Sure, we, we can absolutely do business with them. We have products we can do for that with the software and things but that's not our that's not what we've built for we've built our differentiators in the software and the services really to help people who have a lot of places that are very spread apart where they want to maintain the same brand standards and customer experience okay and you know and and, and then the other question people ask me all i don't know maybe, maybe you're gonna maybe work but i'll tell you what i get asked is people say well yeah but now that bricks and mortar is dying and you know, what, what, what are you guys going to do? And I always laugh. I'm like, bricks and mortar is not that, you know. Um, sure, we have we have delivery. We have curbside pickup. We have mobile ordering, all of those things, right? Um, but that that is still customer experiences with those locations that need to be measured. Right. right? The, the like, customer it, service portion of it isn't, I mean, the right. dynamics of how it's done change a little bit, but it's still got to be, is it working? Is the customer satisfied, <laughs> right? But, and, and and is any of these things degrading my brand? Like, is, is my brand promise being degraded because of one of these other, you know, alternative methods of, of, of service delivery? And and they need to measure that stuff. So it's actually almost more things to measure now as opposed to less. You know, it's not like uh, now we and we can measure online and we do, but obviously it's much less um, because that experience is not uh, as human involved. You know, in terms of the interaction. Right. So, we, so we are still focused on the same, you know, uh, industries, and uh, and we 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 think it's we think it's great. We think it's tons upside. So pre pre pandemic revenue was like off to the races. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you know, pandemic. I mean, look, we don't have very many of those. 
<laughs> not that I'm aware of. No, I, unless unless I missed the news on a couple, I'm only aware of one. But yeah, you took some lumps, right? But you're coming out of this thing. Would you say you're stronger than you were when you when it hit? You know, well, yes and no. So it's interesting because you know if you look at the if, if I look at the if I look at strength and I just look at market share price, you know that kind of stuff. I was stronger going into the pandemic. We were trading up in the up up up, up higher than we are now, and we were only increasing. And I had an acquisition company. I mean, we were we were on path from a market standpoint to be stronger than I am today. The irony here is that as a business, I'm stronger now in many ways than I was during the pandemic because my revenue, yeah, we have that big old drop off at the pandemic, but my revenue for this year is going to be significantly higher than it was before the pandemic. Right? We're back to that pre-pandemic trajectory, right, in terms of revenue. Um, we, we're, we're, we're throwing EBITDA and, 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 and profits at this point to the bottom line, you know, uh, with the even with the bootstrapping. Uh, our software is growing. Um, you know, we have uh, we have taken on a bunch of new logos. We've got a really healthy pipeline. I mean, when I look at the business today, I think fundamentally, I'm at least in as good a shape as I was before the pandemic, if not a little stronger. Right. In fact, I think with some of the executives we brought on with the acquisition that we did last fall, I think I'm a little stronger right now than I was before the pandemic. But the market, because you know, micro cap and and it's it just getting you know beat up. Uh, I have to watch my language if we're being recorded. You know, the, my, uh, it's, the market isn't seeing it. I mean, right now, today, uh, when I look before this, I think you could buy 95,000 shares were available for sale. So we're thinly traded, but we're not, but it's not like you can't buy it. There were 95,000 shares available for trade on the OTCQX at 50 cents or less, right? Which is two thirds of my forecasted revenue to the market, you know, at the low end of my forecast. Um, avail so yeah, it's you know define strength. You know you want you want, you, in terms of how you want to look at. It. But the company is, is is great, and and the pandemic. Remember, as a company, this is what I always remind people: when, when when the pandemic hit, certain companies were in a really cool spot. They were in a spot where that was the kind of thing they could take advantage of. Shopify being the poster child for being in the right place at the right time, right? Um, there were other companies that it caused a speed bump. It caused some issues they had to get around, right? We hit a brick wall. Right? We we had our customers close their doors, right? Um, and yet, right, we went through the entire pandemic EBIT deposit, right? We kept the employees, we kept the clients. We did an acquisition last fall, and we're coming out of it now. I mean, it's. I mean, I, I don't. You know, people ask me about the. Am I worried about the recession? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, nothing's going to be worse than we've been through. <laughs> and that's and that is i think what i you know i asked the question i i know in terms of revenues you you were that you were stronger then however with what you did for your customers and the ones that that survived and i'm sure you know recognize that you helped them survive so I would think that that would make them more loyal customers. Then I would think your employees are also more loyal. So I think you probably came out way stronger now from a business standpoint than, than pre-pandemic, right? Which I think puts you in a great position because hopefully, I mean, who would have thought that we would have come out of a pandemic and head, headed right into a war? I mean- I didn't anticipate that, <laughs> right? And you come out of the pandemic into a war and hyperinflation. It's like, oh, well, this is, this, this is you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I, I uh, the way I was telling people that I said, you know, it's like for a while we were, we were, had our head underwater, right? Um, we outfit ourselves with snorkels so we could try to navigate the storm underwater, you know, and then we finally were able to get our head up, you know, so we could look outside and we didn't recognize the world we were in anymore. Right. Well, and, and what's interesting, I think, about that is, I think the Fed, I, my, here's my personal belief. Now, you brought up the, the micro cap hell for the last 14, 15 months, right? We've been in a bull market for 14 years, where almost every stock was going up. It didn't matter what they did. It, it, 
we haven't had a bear market in a long time. And we have a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace right now. Wall Street hates uncertainty. So I've been waiting for this correction for 14 years, right? But I believe that it's times like this that create incredible opportunities and under-recognized and underappreciated names, right? Especially in the microcap space. That's uh, what is Mar Maj likes to call it the information arbitrage. And I agree with him, right? <clears throat> because there are a lot of companies out there that don't get coverage because, you know, number one, they're too small. Funds can't really cover you. They're not going to take a position in you because if you're running a $10 billion fund, how do you take a 3% <laughs> position in a, you know, it, you can't unless you're just going to buy the company outright, right? So this is the opportunity. This is the time right now when you identify the companies that are underappreciated. And at some point, that fund, the fundamentals are going to resonate. It's going to happen, right? Can't tell you when. I don't know what news release it'll be, right? <laughs> but it'll be, there will be that news release at some point where the light bulb is going to go on for somebody. And when you only have 25 million shares outstanding, it doesn't take a whole lot to have a pretty significant move and a, a, a warranted and deserved move, not mm -hmm. just a pump and dump. You know, that people, this is a good company that has, you know, good revenues, growing revenues. What are the margins? Uh, margins are typically, uh, they were a little over, historically a little in the low 50s. Um, we were a little below 50 in Q2 because we took on a really large, uh, really large one-time project, which was seven figures at lower margin, uh, but typically in the low 50s. And then the, the software component, right? Those have traditional software margins. Uh -huh. Those have traditional software margins, but it's a okay. relatively small part of our overall revenue right now, so it doesn't it doesn't move the needle right now. But so, that's but that's growing. Yes. Okay. All right. So, I mean, we can go through the deck, but I I think really what's more important is what, what comes from your mouth, right? So. If you, as you look out over the next six to 12 months, what are you excited about? Um, Christmas, I love Christmas. <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I, I think that like the bear market in terms of opportunities for investors, I think there's gonna be an opportunity for companies in the customer experience management space as well, because I think a lot of companies are facing the new normal, right? I know it sounds like a cliche, everyone's using it, but it's true. You know, businesses, like I say, you, you know, you popped your head up out of the water and you don't recognize what you're looking at anymore. And they need information, right? Companies need information to succeed. You know, just, you talk, you know, just like investor information, companies do too. You know, they need to know where are their customers happy, where they're not happy, where are the new pain points, where are the new friction points, right? Um, where do they focus their time and attention on training, right? Where do they focus their time and attention on everything? Um, you know, they are very much in need of information. At this point, um, you know, and and I think that uh, that'll create an opportunity uh, for more people uh, to do more programs, more bids. Uh, I also think that, be, you know, for companies like us, the recession actually provides also if, if, if it comes. I don't know. I guess they say recessions when your friend loses their job and a depression when you lose yours. So, you know, um, if it is a recession, you know, uh, that means people are going to also want to cut their budgets. They're going to want to save money. Right. Uh, well, that positions us pretty well in software against people like your, your, your big guys, because we tend to give them a little lower price, right? We're number two when we try harder kind of thing. So uh, we're not positioned badly economically to come to swoop in if people want to save a little money, but something they still need, right? And at the same time, I think people are going to more and more need to do programs. And if, and if they have paused or haven't done things, get out there and do it. There's also a lot of people in our business that did not come through the pandemic as strongly as we did. Right. And so what we're seeing right now, some of our pipeline right now are bidding on business that historically somebody else had maybe. Right. But customers not as happy with them because maybe they didn't handle themselves the same way in the pandemic. As we did. Maybe they don't have the same strength coming on. Maybe they're having trouble getting some of the work done. Maybe they lost some of their team. Right. And so those 
those revenue opportunities are coming up for bid. Uh, you know, for those of us that are maybe a little stronger at these companies. So I think there's some. I think there's. I think there's going to be opportunity um, from just a general market growth standpoint. Uh, and I think. And I think there's an incredible opportunity for us as we look forward in terms of trying to get our get the software sales right. We the product is right. We've got to get the sales and marketing right. We're focused. Okay. All right. So. Acquisitions. You guys did a lot of acquisitions, right? It, pr prior to prior to the pandemic, right? This current market climate, I would think, it, well, at least the last you know last fifteen months, I think has has become a wake up call for a lot of companies that were thinking that they could sell at a multiple of some made up number in their head, <laughs> and now they realize that might have been a little overzealous. Right. I think one of the things, you know, as I look at the microcap market and I look at the a lot of stocks that have taken a beating, but I would say over the last four or five weeks, I'm starting to see stabilization. I think the damage for the most part in the microcap and small cap space has been done. I think most of it is done. I will we see companies disappear? Absolutely. But we're also, I think, going to start seeing mergers and acquisitions pick up. Because if you're a company that is in need of capital and you know you're going to get a shitty financing deal in this climate, you can make a choice. You can do a shitty financing deal and dilute the hell out of your shareholders. Or maybe it makes sense to partner with somebody, either through merger, acquisition, that is in a good financial position that strengthens you both, right? Instead of going out and doing a real crappy deal, you do a, a deal that strengthens you, right? And I think that I, that's what we're going to see. I think we're going to start seeing more merger and acquisition activity. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Um, you know, in, in our space, you know, we, we do tend to, uh, we do tend to um, look at the services companies where we can get stuff a lot cheaper and where we can then sell additional things and have logos to sell software to. And like, you know, there's a bit of a, the services have been a great hunting ground for us. Uh, and in that space, they're pretty much all private companies. So your, your point is probably the same. And I think there will be acquisition opportunities start coming up, but I think it's going to be because of people who built their company once, almost lost during the pandemic, had to start, had to try to rebuild it and now they're going to be looking at it and saying, do I have the energy to do this again? Like, do I want to, like, you know, I, I feel like maybe maybe I can stop now because I'm tired. Right. And that makes sense, too. Right. So that but that creates that creates great opportunity. Yeah. Right. Now, because you have people that are maybe uh, a little more realistic about the valuations of their company and it makes sense to do the acquisition. Whereas I would say maybe 15 months ago, it didn't make sense because people wanted these crazy multiples, right? So I think we've had a resetting there and it creates opportunity for you to grow through acquisition again. I mean, it, if you wanted to, right? If the right opportunity presents itself, you're certainly not going to run away from it. No, we're not. You know, uh, and then we'll just decide how to how to pay for it. Historically, we've avoided the losing as much as possible. Um, you know, and it'll just depend on the prices and forces and all those other things. But yeah, we are always, and I put, I think I put in almost every one of the MDNAs over the years that we're always open to the creative acquisition. I'm not just going to buy. I'm not going to go buy revenue just for the sake of growth. You know, it it, it has to make sense. But we are always open when it makes sense. Okay. All right. So look, I want to. I think, is there anything that I, you feel as though I've, I've missed, Cameron, that you really want to highlight here? I mean, you know, not really. Uh, I, mean, I think you covered a lot of ground there. Uh, we started with my parents' meeting, so I think we covered some pretty good real estate. Um, you know, the only point probably I would make again uh, would be just that I, I do believe that we're, you know, from an investor standpoint, I'd be remiss if I didn't say again that we're an opportunity in terms of, you know, uh, from a risk profile standpoint and a relative upside potential. So let me tell you what I see in your chart, right? It's very uh, different from most of the charts 
that I see in this space because it actually has held up really, really well through the last 15 months. And that's pretty impressive because, I mean, when I'm saying charts, I'm talking, these guys are down 90%, right? Your, your stock looks way stronger than a lot of these uh, charts that are out there for small micro cap companies, right? So as I'm looking at this, I mean, what is your average volume traded per day? It's 10,000 or something like that. Yeah, it's small, right? So you got it's super, super tiny. That makes it challenging, right? But I mean, I have to ask myself, so how many direct competitors would you say you have in the industry? Which industry? So I could I could compete in several, right? Um, I, I mean, there's there's that there's uh, there's two or three gorillas in the survey space, and then there's at least another dozen or more that do you know there's then there's your low end people that compete, um, you know they're kind of app based, and then there's another you know, you probably got to compete with another dozen or so in the in that mid space where where we kind of play a little more uh, on the forms and checklist automation side. Again, you've got you know you got probably you got another dozen or two depending on with it, how much you include for the for the features you know you compete with. Um, and on the uh, mystery shopping side, it's crazy. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm one of the biggest in North America um, in the services side, one of the biggest. Uh, but there's probably, you know, a hundred people who claim that they do it. Um, a lot of those are mom and pops that have one big client that they do, and they do it from their basement. And they always have, even before the pandemic. Uh, you know, but there's, but there's a whole lot of people who claim to be doing it. But what's interesting is, is that. In terms of competitors that do everything I just listed, so in other words, a competitor who can go in and say, I will run your entire customer experience data. Right? I will go to physical on-site visits. I will help you pull your customers. I will let you take your own operational data and I'll put it all in one suite of analytics and show, you know, in terms of those competitors, I don't know, maybe there's maybe there's two or maybe there's a couple others, maybe. Um, pretty big companies too, <laughs> you know, um, that can do it. Um, very few people have access to both of the, of the whole suite. And that's why we specialize in that location-based industry because they need all of that, you know, and right. not very many companies can offer all. So from a, from a chart standpoint, I mean, this is actually, it, it, you're kind of coming up, you can see those three lines that I've got drawn there, right? You're coming up into this. It's like, it's, you're squeezing, almost compressing like a spring, right? So as you continue to, to move this way, it's going to get tighter and tighter. And you're going to break one way or the other. That's just <laughs> the way it's going to happen. And 70 cents or no, actually, what did you, what was the all time high on this? It was up to about 78 cents or so. Yeah. You know, the $1 holler is going to be your big moment, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime you take out the, the $1 holler, it's like you became legitimate, right? Do you get out of the penny stock hell and now you're you're into the dollars round numbers have significant meaning for traders <laughs> and investors right it's like <clears throat> you go you break over two now you're a two dollar stock you're no longer a one dollar stock right so round numbers are really significant you are getting a pickup in volume i mean you had this big spike that you had in volume back here in uh, 2021, do you remember what that was all about? Um, I think that was when people who had kind of been scared because of the world was falling saw our releases and said, holy shit, they're actually doing okay and they're going to be okay. Um, you know, like, because I, I actually know people, I, I have a friend of mine who I didn't even know he owned shares and he, and he admitted to me, but yeah, I had some of your stock and I sold it in, you know, 2020. And, you know, I thought, I thought, I'd, you know, I thought I'd buy some more, maybe when you guys crash farther, you know, then you guys went up, you know, and, <laughs> so I'm like, well, shouldn't the bail. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think that was kind of that time period when people realized, geez, I don't, I don't think they're going bankrupt after all. I think, I think they're going to be they okay. Might be around for a while. Yeah. They, they might, they might make it. And I, and I think that's what caused some of that, which is some of our releases that kind of indicated that, yeah, we were going to be okay. So this is what I see. Uh, so 
I like to, to look at things in terms of a box, right? So you kind of are, are uh, bouncing around within a box, and I'm going to show you where that box is, but oh, here we go. All right, so you're kind of bouncing between, actually, wrong one, these two points right here. Right, so you've got down in the, what is that, 30 looks like 30 this 30 cent range right around there up to that 70 cent range right that's kind of the box that you're trading in right you just recently pulled back and tested or not recently that's on a weekly time frame let me go to the daily the daily looks more choppy because of the fact that it's a thin thinly traded stock there's nothing you can do about that but what did we go we went 2022 that was in march you had a, a pullback to this 30 said 30 cents right around there right and then you went all the way up to 70 and now you're pulling back on lighter volume right i mean you can see this here the volume almost dried up to nothing right for a while and now the volume starting to tick back up a little bit so my and you're hanging out right around your 200 day moving average 50 day and 200 day are big things to uh to technical guys what's interesting is you had a golden cross which you have no idea what the hell i'm talking about there <laughs> but it's a very bullish uh thing for traders technical traders it's when the 50 day crosses above the 200 day right however you're just now experiencing the death cross <laughs> which is but i look at all of this stuff the technicals that's all great and fine and dandy but when you don't have when you're a thinly traded stock it's very easily to manipulate right so yes you might have a death cross occurring here i wouldn't put a whole lot of weight into the death cross but if i'm looking at the stock as a long-term investment and i'm saying okay these are the levels at where it finds some support. This is where it finds resistance. So you know, somewhere in the 30 cent range, you're finding support. And at 70 cents, you're finding resistance, right? That's a pretty big spread. <laughs> that's a pretty, that's a nice percent return on your investment. If you can nail it at right around 30 cents and sell it at 70 cents, that wouldn't suck if you could do that over and over again, right? I don't view this as a trading stock because it's a thinly traded stock. I view this as a long-term investment, right? And then I have to ask, what's my risk reward in this? And I think the risk reward is pretty favorable in, in my view, right? So in this area where it's trading in the 40 to 50 cent range, 50 cents is a big, big one too, right? Fit, half dollar. I mean, that's a, that's a psychologically, that's a, that's a big number. So if you can hold 50 cents, right. And maybe that's where you look to take a starter position. Yeah. I'm not telling anybody to buy the stock. That isn't what I do. I just present the, the opportunity and what I see. And I think at 50 cents, your risk reward is pretty good because your downside is 30 cents. The upside is 70 cents, but if you break through 70 cents and you close above that, right? Now you've got maybe a new, a whole new move that looks to happen. And I think the buck, the one dollar is is your target, right? Is to get past that and then let it base and continue to. And I think your volume will pick up from there as well once it gets over a dollar, right? So from what I'm hearing from you, from what we talked about today, you're feeling pretty good about how you're positioned. You have a product that no matter if we go into a recession or not, I think if we go into a recession, it becomes even more, more important, right? To have something that is gauging what's working, what's not working for companies. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, obviously, we'll vary by company. If the companies are in, if companies themselves are in financial trouble, they either cut things like this or they t tip harder into them to get out of their trouble. But in general, we don't get impacted that much by recessions because people need to know what's going on with their operations. Right. So 
from a risk reward standpoint, from where the the strength that the that the stock has shown in a sector that has been taken out to the woodshed, that in itself kind of gives you an indication of the company, right? And and the strength that the company has. You held up extremely well. So from a risk reward standpoint, I feel pretty good about dipping my toe at 50. If it goes to 30, am I dumping? <laughs> no, I'm adding, right? Because I know that's an area of support. So that would be that would be how I would look at the stock. I would look at it and say, okay, look, I'm going to take a starter position here. And if it does pull back because of the overall markets, if the markets get weak and look, September, uh, you know, August, September, October, typically are not great months for the overall market historically, right? So if that's the case, you see some weakness, that's an opportunity for me to add to the position at an area of potential support, which is 30 cents. And if it breaks below 30 cents, am I getting out? Probably not. Probably going to look to add more. I'm one of those, you know, build the position, bring down the dollar cost average, and have the patience to wait out the story. The story is good here, right? I think anybody that follows me knows you can have a good product, you can have a good service, you don't have a good leader then I think the odds are stacked against you. And I think, Cameron, you are a good leader, right? Appreciate that. If I hear your strategy correctly, you're going to try to buy low and sell high? <laughs> you know what? That is that is exactly what I'm talking about. That's Cameron. what I thought I heard. I, 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 I also <laughs> think it's a great idea. Um, I, I would also say that I'll be surprised if we see 30s again. Um, given that we're now kind of moving forward after the pandemic. I think some of that was environmental. I, I, who knows? Hell, I, I don't have crystal ball either. The bear market can do what it does. But, um, um. Stock, look, stocks, one thing I've learned is that no matter what you think the stock, okay, cheap can always get cheaper and expensive can always get more expensive. Whether it makes sense or not, Wall Street is not this efficient pricing mechanism that everyone thinks it is. <laughs> It is not. It, when things are cheap, they can get cheaper. And when things are expensive, they can get more expensive. What I think is that this is neither right now. This is, indec this is indecisive is what this is. But you're coming to a point where it's going to, it's like a coiled spring. You're going to break one way or the other. And I would say with what you have on the horizon, the odds that it breaks in a favorable direction I think are better than the odds that it's going to break in an unfavorable direction. Does that make sense to you? Totally. Okay. So Cameron, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you back at some point, right? Maybe uh, when you, you just reported a quarter two, right? Great numbers, great growth. Are you seeing any kind of, is there anything that you're, that's keeping you up at night? Honestly, uh, not right now. Um, you know, uh, and again, I think after the last couple of years, it takes a lot. Um, but you know, we are we're we're. I'm really pleased to be honest with you with with where we are and where we're going. Um, you know, do I do I worry about delivering on you know on additional growth and on setting up next year for success and on all those things? Of course. I mean, if you didn't worry about things in your business, then you're probably an idiot um but but uh, but i have nothing that you know that i'm that keeps me up and then i'm just you know how are we going to deal with this problem like I, you know just all the constant ongoing things that that you think about at night as, as, a, as, a, as a leader of a company uh, but nothing nothing today like it's been you know so you already answered my insider participation question you're like the largest shareholder just i'm actually the second large i'm actually second. second another board member owns a little more than me because he, the way he's carrying his shares allows him to be over 10%. Um, but so I'm the second largest next to one of our other board members, Eric Butel. And we already know all the employees have a piece, right? I mean, these are positive things to me. These are build, building a case as to why I like a stock and you just keep checking off the boxes, right? And, and so far, my other question, why wouldn't you be a, an acquisition target? 
Oh, well, we, we would be uh, for sure. I mean, if somebody wanted to pick up a really good deal, uh, right? But but here's the problem. If, if you come in, like, let's say we're trading at 50 cents, okay? And somebody comes in and says, yeah, we'll give you 70 cents. It's a, you know, it's a 40% uplift and we'll give that to you. And the problem is my shareholders will vote it down, I would guess. I mean, we'd obviously have an obligation to present it, but people would say, I, I, I don't think it would, I don't think my current shareholder base would vote yes to that. I think they would look at it and go, no, the company's worth more than that. It's going to be worth more than that. We're not going to vote. So, you know, so, so while we are technically an acquisition target, that's only if the shareholders would vote to sell it at the price people think they can steal it at. Um, and I just don't think that's an option for us. Right. All right. I want to have you back. I, I think this, look, if you're not if familiar with the name, do your own due diligence. But I think Cameron's done a really good job of explaining what the company does, where you're positioned, where you where you want to go, right? Um, you don't want to buy the stock and take a starter today. Fine, put it on your radar, right? That put it on your watch list. That's what I'm suggesting. Continue to you know go to their investor alert service, which is right above my head here. Go to the website, sign up for their email alerts, stay in touch with their story, right? And see if Cameron continues to deliver and execute and that's and so far you've done a fantastic job that's why i say i think you're the guy that's gonna take it where where you want it to go right eventually it's just you have to have some patience so we'll have you back maybe you said there's some rfps coming uh no no i no there i mean we've got obviously we're, we're always in rfps first of all that's our pipeline right that's okay that's but we, our next, our next uh, uh, news release will likely be uh, near the end of November when we do our uh, Q3 release. Will be the next time we have kind of some more information out there. Okay. Then, so uh, then after that, it's a big long gap to get the year end and the auditor finish with you, uh, which is typically for us the end of March, early April. Okay. All right, Cameron. Thank you so much for coming in and, and doing this interview. And like I said, we'll, we'll I'm going to stay in touch, much more in touch with you than I have been. Um, and I, like, I will probably have a position in the stock by the end of this week, if not today, um, we'll see. But I am absolutely going to get involved in the stock. And I, I love the story. And I think you're doing a, a bang up job. And we'll have you back and we'll see how things are, are performing in the next quarter or so. Sound like a plan? It sounds like a plan. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time to talk, Tim. And uh, best luck with you and all of your investments and all of your investors and their investments. All right. Hold on a second. Let me shut this off. Hey, all you stock market junkies. Thanks for tuning in to yet another CEO interview here at Alpha Wolf Trading. Today we had In Touch Insight, ticker symbol INXSF, Cameron Watt, CEO. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And if you did, do us a favor, give us a like. How about giving us a share? While you're at it, why not give us a follow? Until next time, stay safe. Alpha Wolf Trading wishes you the very best of success.